Welcome to the Orchestrate All the Things podcast. I'm George Amadiotis and we'll be connecting the dots together. When it comes to digital transformation stories, two of the most iconic examples are Kodak and Amazon. Kodak failed to keep with the times, leading to the demise of a once dominant commercial empire. Amazon, however, had the foresight to not just stay in its lane, but step out of its comfort zone and shape the world's digital infrastructure with AWS. It looks like Lexmark is keen on learning not only to avoid being left behind, but to turn its vision and lessons learned into products others can use. Founded in 1991, uh, Lexmark is recognized as a global leader in print hardware service solutions and security, according to the company itself. Moving beyond printers, supplies and accessories, which is how Lexmark first made the name for itself, the company's current motto seems to be print, secure and manage your information. In 2022, Lexmark lists print and capture as just two of its solutions, which also include cloud, security and IoT. The Lexmark Optra IoT platform, unveiled in September 2021, is featured prominently on the company site. Today, Lexmark is unveiling Optra Edge, the latest addition to its Optra IoT solutions portfolio. We caught up with Lexmark Senior VP, Connected Technology and Chief Information and Technology Officer Vishal Gupta to discuss the backstory of Lexmark's move into IoT, Optra IoT adoption and Optra Edge. I hope you will enjoy the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. My name is uh, Vishal Gupta. I joined Lexmark a little over a year ago uh, in uh, February 1st of uh, last year. I, I had a lot of experience in the technology industry. Prior to this, I was the global CTO for Unisys, and uh, I was also the founder of a lot of the IoT efforts at Cisco. And, um, uh, you know, I, I kind of play two or three roles at Lexmark. Uh, so I'm the, uh, you know, I'm responsible for as a CIO for all the experiences for our employees. Uh, we have over 8,000 employees. And then as a CTO, I'm also responsible for building uh, products and experiences for our customers. Um, and so, you know, I kind of cross both the the internal stakeholder and external stakeholder definition. And uh, one of the key things that attracted me to Lexmark was, uh, you know, our whole uh, uh, focus on innovation in the IoT space. You know, Lexmark has been uh, doing a lot of work in IoT actually for uh, over a decade. Uh, each printer has over 120 IoT sensors, and you know they had the ambition to really take that, all the learning that they've had over uh, over uh, maybe 15 years, and take that to the market to enable other manufacturers and other uh, type of enterprise customers to also get value from IoT. And so that was one of the reasons I got attracted. Um, and in addition to these two roles, I'm also uh, in charge of our corporate strategy. So I also look at how do we transform the company overall. And so, uh, you know, uh, that's a little bit about me, uh, George, in terms of, uh, you know, when I joined Lexmark and the areas I'm responsible for. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for, for sharing that. And uh, it kind of makes sense uh, when I hear you talk about uh, your, your own background and, uh, the fact that you've been involved in IoT efforts uh, before, uh, because, well, to be honest with you, I did not, I wasn't aware of the fact that uh, Lexmark has been active in that area as well. So I know that in uh, September uh, you announced uh, the Optra IoT platform, uh, and uh, looking uh, and looking at the uh, the background of that announcement and the rationale uh, behind it, um, what you just mentioned um, all seems to to come into play. So. Um, reiterating uh, quickly for the benefit of people who may be listening. So, uh, as you pointed out, uh, Lexmark has been using IoT uh, sensors, uh, to be more uh, specific, in its own uh, hardware for quite a while now and uh, leveraging uh, this this effort to, um, to achieve things such as uh, better visibility into potential hardware uh, failures. And I think uh, you can also share some of the results uh, Lexmark uh, has gotten through those efforts. And uh, the Lexmark uh, Optra IoT platform was basically uh, an effort to uh, productize, let's say, that experience and that know-how for, uh, for others. So, um, 
Um, I'm going to let you uh, jump in uh, actually at this point and will just uh, share with us a few words on um, uh, how the platform came along and uh, what uh, who is it aimed for basically. Uh, let's let's start with that and uh, sure. uh, we'll follow up. Yeah, so you know, as you mentioned, we launched the platform in September um, in the IoT World Congress and a number of other forums. And uh, the 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 key thing that we try to do with a platform is, uh, you know, given our own experience uh, as Lexmark with not just the IoT sensors in one printer, which are, uh, as I mentioned, over 120 uh, sensors in one IoT sensor in one printer alone. But we also manage millions of these printers right through what we call as a managed print service. So really, if you think about it, uh, we have experience at scale uh, with managing you know, hundreds of millions of sensors. And more importantly, you know, if you think about it, the challenge in IoT has not been so much on the concept or the fact that the technology works. It's really been more around the business outcomes, right? If you look at McKinsey said, 84% of the IoT projects get stuck in pilots because people typically are not able to demonstrate the business outcomes, right? The so what? And so I think what where we were able to differentiate ourselves was that we were able to not just use and, and show in production hundreds of millions of sensors, but we were able to create three or four very interesting business outcomes. Let me give you an example, right? What we've been able to do with these sensors is that uh, in over 95% of the cases, we can predict uh, when a problem will happen. And 70% of those cases, we're able to remotely fix the problem. Now that's uh, you know typically thought about predictive maintenance in the industry. And this is across our entire fleet, which is hundreds of types of printers. So this is actually very compelling because this is a win-win for both the customer who gets into much less downtime and uh, for us because it results into you know a, a more loyal customer our achievement of the sla and a lower cost for us similarly we're able to you know go from what used to really be a one-time transaction with these customers to now with our management service really create more of a recurring revenue stream and therefore predictability for both the customers and us uh, so to give you a sense of that we have over 800 large uh, enterprise customers in fortune 3000 working with us uh, you know, where we manage these uh, thousands of uh, fleet of printers, which for us are one of the first IoT connected devices. And, and that has helped us create recurring revenue stream um, and create predictability for the customer. Uh, similarly, you know, we've been able to create other outcomes like uh, we're able to, uh, with all the data that we're getting from these sensors from the printers, we're able to reduce the time to introduce new products by 50%. So, so better systemic innovation, you know, better, uh, uh, great automation in terms of automatically sensing the level and, and automatically shipping the supplies without anybody touching anything, um, thereby again improving uh, the outcome for both the customers and us. And, and, and there is tens of thousands of those shipped every day with nobody touching anything. And so what we try to do is we said, okay, we've achieved all these pretty amazing uh, business outcomes leveraging an IoT platform, can we take it to market to enable other maker of connected devices to achieve similar outcomes? Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, this is just one type of connected device. And so that's the that was the motivation that we had. Uh, and you know, we've been working with a number of manufacturers since our announcement, enabling some very interesting outcomes. Um, and uh, one of the things we've been able to do, even for our own business, which uh, even in the last maybe six months has been with all the supply chain disruption, right? Uh, it's been very difficult to uh, get materials and create new things for everybody in the industry. And so we've been able to also take this data that comes from these uh, devices and be able to extend the life of these devices itself by almost 25%. And so we call this smart refresh uh, last year, uh, almost in our fleet, you know, we were targeting maybe 50% uh, such refreshes, but we were able to uh, do a smart refresh of almost 80% of our devices by being able to predict which of them after a number of years needed replacement, where we could just replace maybe a component or a subsystem instead of the entire device, and do that based upon not just the data coming now, but also looking at the service history, looking at data from a variety of other systems, thereby making the right decision, and then also that saves capital expense for the customer as well. 
And so uh, that's a little bit of a genesis on what, why when it is the platform, the outcomes that we saw. And, and initially we focused on connected manufacturers, but later this year we'll also expand that for retailers as well. Um, and in this announcement, uh, uh, which is what we're announcing now, is really around the next step in IoT, because you know one part is, okay, how do you collect the data through the cloud and do all these processing and the pipelines and create all those outcomes? Uh, but everybody doesn't uh, prefer cloud or all the use cases are not relevant to cloud, especially if you think about low latency, uh, high bandwidth use cases, especially with real-time audio, video. And so what we're doing now is really sort of a follow-on from that to really introduce a set of edge capabilities. So, so if you think about a factory floor, right? We have a lot of factories ourselves. We don't connect factories to cloud from both a security perspective and also from you know the perspective of the we want 24 by 7 operation on those factories we can't afford it to go down and so uh so that's where i think in the market for iot you need a continuum of cloud use cases and edge use cases and uh i believe will be one of the first uh, companies in the world to actually have both mm -hmm. okay thanks uh, actually, that was a bit more uh, than what I was uh, that that one than what I specifically asked for, but that that's fine. Uh, I mean, in the sense that um, uh, you also uh, expanded to cover uh, what you're announcing uh, in uh, in a couple of days, so uh, the Lexmark uh, Optrides. But let's uh, we'll we'll get to that. Actually, before we do though, I wanted to um, ask you to uh, to clarify something which was not entirely clear to me. So uh, when um, uh, when utilizing uh, IoT and uh, sensors and analytics uh, internal, let's say, for your own product line, uh, it's it's relatively straightforward where the data is coming from. Uh, all those uh, sensors that are embedded in each uh, device, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, when productizing this, though, uh, for uh, for third parties uh, to use, uh, where will the data be coming from? And it may sound like a naive question, but well. I'm presuming that many of the um, of the organizations uh, that you're addressing may be uh, Lexmark uh, customers, so some of the data may be coming from from your own devices. But what other type of uh, devices is the platform able to work with? And um, just to uh, to to be uh, entirely clear about it, it is um, a platform that um, entails software, right? It doesn't come with any hardware. Yeah. So when we announced the Opt-IoT platform that was a platform running in software. Uh, there was no hardware uh, with it. And um, where the data comes from is, you know, we can take both streaming data and batch data. Um, the streaming data typically will come from IoT sensors. Uh, to give you an example, some of the IoT sensors we support on the wireless side will be things with LoRaWAN or Bluetooth or, or those kinds of them. We also support industrial sensors, things like Modbus or OPC. We also support things, uh, for example, in building management uh, protocols like BACnet and others. And so, because we're built on top of Microsoft Azure IoT Hub, uh, there are uh, a very large list of protocols uh, that the sensors can communicate in. Uh, sometimes, you know, the native IoT protocol is called MQTT, but it doesn't just have to be that. It could be a variety of other protocols. And that's where the edge can come in as well, because the edge can actually convert from one of the proprietary or less known protocols to maybe a standard IoT protocol like MQTT. And, and so we can collect data from things like cranes, from, from say dental machines, from mining equipment, really from any type of device through the use of those sensors. And that data essentially flowing to the cloud with the IoT hub. Uh, and that's sort of the, the classic platform use case. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, you did mention the Azure IoT uh, platform. That's something I uh, also wanted to ask you about because uh, just by um, going through uh, some background material, it looked to me like um, you are uh, using uh, Azure indeed. And so right. that's that's clear already. Uh, what I wanted to ask you uh, in addition to that is whether uh, the platform also runs on other cloud uh, vendors or it's exclusively on Azure. Yeah, currently it's exclusive on Azure. Uh, we certainly have, because we use a lot of open industry standards, we certainly have the capability of running it on other uh, cloud providers as well. 
Uh, but currently, um, Azure is where we're sort of certified in terms of uh, knowing that uh, you know it will work end to end. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, let's get to what is actually the most interesting part. So thanks for uh, sharing the um, uh, some details on how the infrastructure, let's say, is set up and uh, using uh, those uh, open uh, protocols. Uh, what types of uh, analytics and what types of applications can users uh, uh, build on, uh, on Lexmark's uh, platform? Um, are there some out-of-the-box analytic capabilities or uh, machine learning models or applications that uh, sure. users can uh, customize? Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, when we introduce the platform, and again, I'm talking about the platform because I think that's what you're talking about, not the edge yet, right? So mm -hmm. on the platform itself, uh, you know, we thought about for a manufacturer, what type of machine learning models make a lot of sense. And we wanted to provide two types of capabilities. We wanted to provide a capability for where people could, through just a low code way through drag and drop, uh, essentially build both new machine learning models. Because, you know, let's say you you have a dental machine and you will need to be able to sort of predict when it will fail and it may have 40 different components. and you know, there is sort of an iterative journey that you go along in terms of that, uh, what we call as descriptive, predictive and prescriptive analytics. So you've got that capability, which we now make much easier uh, by enabling uh, not only a ready-made platform that can process the data in terms of a hot path, a cold path, but also enabling people to build these through a drag and drop, uh, very sort of a simple interface, if you may. And then we also provide a lot of the out of the box uh, machine learning models itself, we call them accelerators. And the idea is that, um, and you know, we spent a lot of time with a lot of manufacturers and what we found was that people are looking for, they are looking for not an experiment, they're looking for an experience, right? And they want it fast, right? That's why a lot of the stuff gets stuck in the pilot stage. And so some of the machine learning models that we really provide out of the box are for things like anomaly detection, and you can have many types of anomaly detection, right? Anomaly detection can be specific to a subsystem, can be specific to a part, can be specific to the entire device. And it'll sort of help you to decide if there is something strange happening that's causing that particular part or device or a subsystem to behave the way it does. Uh, we, are, we provide machine learning models for fleet optimization. So for example, if you were trying to decide for a given customer, do I refresh the entire fleet or only a part of it? Uh, how old is my fleet? What does are the characteristics of it? How does it compare to my other fleets? Uh, we have machine learning models for that, which we use in the smart refresh uh, concept that I talked about. We have machine learning models for predictive services. So our ability to predict when something might fail um, and, and do that with a higher level of accuracy. We also have machine learning models for predictive consumption. Uh, so all the consumables or perishables, uh, in the case of printers, you know, uh, cons uh, the, the consumables, the ability to predict when a cartridge will run out is actually very key because you don't want to uh, under or over predict it. If you, if you, you know, have an error in that prediction, you might have the stuff replaced much earlier than needed, or you might have cases where if customers run out and essentially they're not able to do operation and, you know, it's critical to, uh, to optimize that. So those are the types of machine learning models that we have out of the box. Uh, but more importantly, I think we have the overall infrastructure that enables people to build the models that are relevant to them. And we think these out of the box model kind of cut 70 to 80% of the time for them to get something that's relevant to them into production. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned um, a no-code uh, environment that people can use uh, to work with the platform. And so I was wondering if uh, basically if this is the only way uh, that people can do that. And uh, what I mean by that is that, well, uh, this may actually be a very good choice for people who don't uh, have much of a technical background, like uh, you know, floor managers or uh, uh, people with, uh, with uh, that sort of role. Uh, however, there 
and maybe the need to um, to customize things in a more uh, fine uh, in a more uh, fine-grained way. So, are yeah. data scientists and people with a more technical background able to um, uh, to uh, to open the hood, let's say, and uh, get uh, get uh, more uh, hands-on with uh, with the code? If yeah, maybe? No, we provide we we support both the personas. So we support you know that's the traditional persona that typically the industry has supported which we support as well, given it built on top of open standards where, you know, you'll have your Jupyter notebook. You can, you know, with the Python, go and make any of the changes you want. Uh, but what we found out was that in a number of industries, you know, it's been very hard for people to retain. Even if they're able to go into production now, they, they have a hard time in terms of retraining those things as new data comes, right? So that's where we give them the choice to say you could, leverage it with both an expert and also with people who are not an expert uh, so you can uh, not just put them into production initially but also keep them uh, updated as you go on mm -hmm. okay thank you and just uh, just as a curiosity really um are there specific uh, machine learning frameworks that are supported and the reason i'm asking you that is that well um well, if many many Data science, for example, uh, must be familiar with uh, the kind of standard industry frameworks such as uh, uh, such as deep learning frameworks and Scikit and Python and so on. So, um, are there specific frameworks that uh, yep. are supported so, that people can yeah, that's, that's reuse their their skills in? Yeah, so all of those are supported. The ones you mentioned because those are just part of common uh, standards. So, as part of ML, you know, Open ML framework, uh, they are all mm -hmm. supported. The ones you mentioned. Uh, okay. And, you know, the, the challenge is not so much in supporting those standards. The challenge is how do you make them easy, right? So that's the yeah. problem we're yeah. trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so that brings us to uh, the latest uh, addition to the platform. So the Optera Edge that uh, you're about to announce. And uh, right. as you uh, briefly mentioned in your introduction, uh, this is basically expanding the capabilities of the platform with uh, uh, adding the uh, the option for uh, analytics and applications to be uh, deployed at the edge. That means there is no round trip, uh, no uh, extra uh, latency in sending the data to a cloud platform, and also in terms of uh, security and uh, compliance, uh, which is uh, which very often dictate that uh, this is the case. So. I wanted to ask you again, what types of uh, devices uh, does uh, the Optoroids work with? And uh, this is a more specialized question than the general case, because sure. um, if you uh, if you move uh, the compute and also much of the data storage, I uh, presume, to uh, to the edge, then it means probably that um, the uh, the range of devices that can be supported is limited in the sense that there probably is some kind of minimum requirements to be able to uh, to do this. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And um, so what we are doing in Optra Edge is really providing an end-to-end -end solution ourselves. This means we're supplying the hardware. So there are we're we're essentially providing two types of compute and two types of what we call as Optra Vision devices. Uh, the compute devices actually, even though we're announcing now, have been available for about a year. We are already are deployed in thousands. Uh, especially in retail stores where they've been running things like, uh, you know, um, ads or music or things like that, that, uh, you know, we've got a very interesting use case with a partner that they run and they kind of create, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an outcome for those retailers uh, in terms of both creating a new revenue stream for them as well as creating uh, an ability for those retailers to essentially create a more interesting environment in the stores. The Optra Vision devices are, you know, are a place where we have, uh, you know, we talk a little bit, as you know, about open standards. So there, what we have done is we have said uh, these uh, Optra Vision devices, you know, can run standard RTSP protocol, which is the standard protocol that comes from the cameras. So that way, pretty much anybody's cameras feeds can be processed. There are two devices and they, they leverage, uh, you know, a very, uh, one of them device is more targeted towards the recording of all of those camera uh, pieces and analyzing things. The other is really around uh, really uh, what we call as the detection of uh, of uh, 
object, so it's really more on visual detection capability. Uh, they're built on top of uh, NVIDIA's or uh, chips uh, that essentially provide very high end, uh, you know, uh, uh, processing uh, in terms of being able to uh, do this type of analysis. And uh, and and this is actually, you know, we're providing not just the the boxes themselves. Uh, which are you know which are also certified by Microsoft. So these all these four boxes are Azure level one certified, which means that they can instantly connect to the cloud. Um, not all the time, but they're typically for provisioning. Uh, they're kind of managed you know from 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 a central place, so that way uh, the the customer can easily manage them uh, on an ongoing basis if they have to update them, update the firmware, do anything. And then what they have is well, we have taken Docker containers as a standard protocol in terms of we're able to provide both the hardware, the management, and the actual end-to-end -end application. And so to give you an example of that, we're introducing, when we introduce Optra Edge, uh, we have about uh, 20 use cases that are built out of the box uh, in the manufacturing world, in the retail world, in the parking uh, or transportation world where people will be customers will be able to essentially run that AI on the edge for very specific outcomes. And I'll give you an example of what outcome uh, which we have leveraged ourselves. So as I mentioned to you earlier in the manufacturing floor, you don't really want, uh, you know, you don't want to be connected all the time to cloud because if the cloud goes down, you don't want manufacturing to go down. Uh, but an intermittent connection is typically OK. And so uh, we, you know, when you think about a manufacturing line, uh, through the cameras, you can do visual inspection uh, as part of quality, right? So the visual inspection can check for is the right packaging done, is the right screws put in place, is the right wires put in place, is the right um, uh, all the other capabilities in place um, to essentially make sure that this thing meets the standards. Uh, in the past, humans have done it. Now, through this Optra Edge device with the AI running in it for visual inspection, yeah. we're able to do it and we create amazing outcomes. For example, we're able to uh, uh, do things like 40% uh, improvement in the inspection speed. We saw that in three months, uh, we can actually uh, break even in terms of the investment. Uh, we are able to achieve uh, almost a 99% reduction in the errors that were happening manually. And so, what this will let the customers do is um, whether you are in manufacturing for all these visual inspection use cases or you are in retail for a number of use cases that we have in retail or for example uh, you're dealing with uh, uh, you know logistics in terms of uh, parking or the movement of goods uh, we can create some very interesting outcomes and so that's what the Optra Edge announcement is about it's to really create that open ecosystem where both we, because we're providing these, we're also, by the way, run, working with about a dozen startups. So think about it like an app store. We're providing a number of AI use cases ourselves, but a number of startups, you know, who are working with us, uh, who don't have a big go to market, are creating the capability to essentially run that AI in our uh, operation devices, which are sort of can be managed from the cloud and thereby creating a very easy to use solution to create very specific outcomes for the manufacturers, for the retailers, uh, for even uh, you know folks who have say uh, vehicles and logistics and things like that. And, and later on, uh, towards the end of the year, we'll introduce even additional verticals as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And that sort of uh, addresses um, another question I had to you, which was going to be about uh, vertical integration and what it meant exactly. So I think it makes sense now having uh, having uh, listened to, to what you just said. So basically, as opposed to um, the, uh, the the initial, let's say, uh, Lexmark uh, Optra IoT platform, in that case, um, you uh, you don't just uh, provide access to to the platform, but you also provide the hardware and uh, devices and the sensors and everything that goes with it. And you also mentioned that you uh, have some partnerships going on with uh, with third parties, uh, startups, and so on that. Uh, they basically leverage this infrastructure to create um, domain-specific applications, if I got it right. You're exactly right. And so, you know, because we think the amount of innovation, you know, um, uh, George, uh, if you look at the predictions, right, they talk about Edge becoming a $284 billion market. I think what will be needed is 
not so much how big their edge market is, but how do you make it relevant to create the, to solve the problems that people are having, right? How do you create those business outcomes? And so what we're trying to do with both the platform and the edge is to really give our enterprise customers choices of being able to really become AI and data rich and leverage those capabilities to create very specific outcomes for them and give them choices as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's wrap up uh, with a little bit on the um, on the business strategy basically for this. So I'm sure. um, uh, presuming that uh, addressing existing uh, customers, uh, brownfield case, let's say, was probably uh, your uh, your starting point. And sure. so I wanted to ask you on that, so how has it been working? And if there are any adoption metrics or uh, specific uh, use cases that you can share. And uh, to, for the second part, I was wondering if uh, it is within uh, Lexmark's uh, strategy to also uh, use this as an opportunity to address uh, potentially non-customers and not uh, existing customers, uh, um, following in the footsteps of, uh, well, the, the, the birth of AWS, uh, if you could say that. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I think uh, uh, we certainly look, when we are looking at this market, we're looking at combination of both existing. And, you know, if you look at it, uh, we have, for example, 100 retailers as existing customers today, right, in our managed print services business, which is where we're managing printers, which happen to be an IT device. So that makes a lot of sense. But what's interesting is what we're finding is, uh, George, that there's a lot of customers who are not our existing customers, especially in the manufacturing side, because we don't have a very big manufacturing base, even though we're manufacturing our uh, kind of company ourselves, who are very interested in partnering with us. And so I would say what our experience is so far, that it's been 50-50, even on opera age that we're reducing, you know, we're engaged in about maybe a dozen opportunities and it's half and half. Half of them are existing, half of them are new. In fact, as you know, this uh, week HIMSS is going on. And, and you know, we were just uh, engaging with a number of healthcare providers uh, out of which I think there were about uh, yesterday, about a dozen of them engaging with us out of which probably four of them were only existing, eight were new, but they saw so many interesting use cases for themselves uh, that they could see, uh, you know, why they would use it. and so. Our emphasis from a business perspective is obviously start first we start with ourselves because we want to prove that this thing actually works and creates real outcomes because you know we are very large enterprise customer ourselves. So our teams are very relentless in terms of they want very easy to manage, very high security, very easy to change things, right? And so first we try to perfect the technology ourselves. Then we try to typically take it to existing customers because they uh, you know, there's a trusted relationship and they can give us very open feedback. We create kind of an advisory board. And then simultaneously, we end up also engaging with new customers to uh, when we have the confidence that this thing will work. And so that's the stage where we're at, where it's sort of been uh, half and half. And uh, what we're also doing is uh, we're also having some of the system integrators uh, like the, the likes of Cognizance of the world and even Microsoft itself be a very strong partner with us on the go-to-market side where they're not only certifying these but jointly talking to customers uh, as these things kind of run on their platform as well as I mentioned on Azure and similarly the system integrators like Cognizant are building a practice where they can you know help in uh, rolling these out for large customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I would say that uh, con all things considered, um, I mean, the fact that it's relatively early in the uh, life cycle of uh, this offering, um, it sounds encouraging uh, if you say that um, you have about 50-50 uh, split in terms of existing and uh, new customers. So uh, let's wrap up by asking you well to uh, share a little bit on your roadmap, let's say. So what's next in the in the coming year after uh, releasing uh, Lexmark uh, Optra Edge? Sure. So as you know, in September we released the uh, the Optra platform, which was specifically for manufacturing. We call it Bishop. Now in uh, March. Uh, end of March, as you know, we're releasing the Optra Edge, which initially is focused on manufacturing, retail, and some of the, the logistics use cases, and we'll have about maybe 20 use cases out of the box. What we want to get by the end of the year is uh, both to get into retail for the platform, so we want to extend the platform use cases to retail as well, and we want to scale up 
our number of edge use cases to about uh, 50 or more. And that's where the work with the startups becomes very important in terms of, uh, you know, adding a number of use cases. Like right now, we may have about five retail use cases. I want to actually expand to say 10 retail use cases. So it doesn't cover just the front office of retail, but also covers the warehouses and how do you manage that and all of those pieces as well. And so that's kind of what we see uh, for uh, the year uh, 22. And then, you know, uh, we're also looking at how do we not just think about platform and the edge separately, but even in the same use case, think of them together. And how do we enable that seamless integration where, you know, the data, the, the AI gets trained in the cloud and then the on the edge, it essentially gets executed, but then all the metadata of it gets sent to the cloud so that way it can get retrained better and better. And so there's sort of very interesting use cases from an integration perspective that we're working on as well. And the next year we'll you know, expand into more, uh, both more verticals and also more areas of integration. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you like my work, you can follow Link Data Orchestration on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook.